John Frankenheimer's The Manchurian Candidate is one of those great films that takes a premise that is so outlandish and outrageous, it's sometimes even comedic, and yet it makes it all seem quite possible. Allow me to introduce our American visitors. I must ask you to forgive their somewhat lackadaisical manners, but I have conditioned them or brainwashed them, which I understand is the new American word. Richard Condon's 1959 novel basically asked, as Briel Marcus later wrote, quote, what if, what if Joe McCarthy was really working for the Russians and the Chinese, for the very communists he was supposedly trying to destroy? Now, that might seem crazy on its face, but when you think of the divisions and the destruction wreaked by the demagogue from Wisconsin, it's easy to see that McCarthy was, in fact, doing the work of the enemies of America, whether he believed so or not. Now, I've always appreciated the Manchurian candidate, but I didn't begin researching it until I began exploring it as a possible setting for scenes in my novel, The Devil May Dance. Now, my book, which is fiction, is based on and inspired by a very real event. Frank Sinatra having work done to his Rancho Mirage compound to prepare for a 1962 California swing by President John F. Kennedy, for whom he had campaigned. Now, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, in the midst of a crackdown on organized crime, was worried about whether his brother should stay there because of Sinatra's rumored ties to the mob. So as I wrote the novel, I too tried a what if. What if Congressman Charlie Martyr and his wife Margaret, the heroes of my previous novel, The Hellfire Club, what if Attorney General Kennedy had Charlie and Margaret go quietly investigate Sinatra at Kennedy's behest to see how mobbed up Sinatra really was? And luckily for me, guess what Sinatra was doing right around then in early 1962? He was portraying brainwashed soldier Captain Bennett Marco in The Manchurian Candidate. An apt movie set for Charlie Martyr, a congressman and World War II veteran, to come serve as a consultant and befriend Sinatra. I tell you, there's something phony going on. There's something phony about me, about Raymond Shaw, about the whole Medal of Honor business. Now, in my book, the idea of Charlie being a consultant to the film is Robert Kennedy's, since he knows the head of United Artists Studios, Arthur Krim. And in real life, too, the Kennedys knew Krim. In fact, that relationship was integral to the Manchurian candidate being made. Krim, in addition to being a powerful studio head, was an advisor and fundraiser for many Democrats, and he was so sensitive to the needs of Kennedy that he initially balked at making a film that involved a conspiracy to assassinate a political leader. Raymond, what are you Daniel O'Brien, a historian of Sinatra films, reports that Krim, quote, felt that the political storyline, complete with corruption, communist infiltration, and assassination, could be both embarrassing and harmful to Kennedy, especially given the ongoing American-Russian negotiations over limiting nuclear tests. Hey, Sarge, cut it up. <laughs> quiet, Ed, please. Now you just sit there quietly and cooperate. Novelist Condon later said that the only way the Manchurian candidate got made was because Sinatra personally lobbied President Kennedy to tell Arthur Krim that it was okay with him to make the movie. <laughs> Kennedy, in fact, had loved Condon's book. His reaction was to inquire about the casting. That's great, Kennedy said. Who's playing the mother? The answer, by the way, is Angela Lansbury, who was only a few years older than Lawrence Harvey, the actor who played her son. Raymond, if we were at war, and you were suddenly to become infatuated with the daughter of a Russian agent, wouldn't you expect me to come to you and object and beg you to stop the entire thing before it was too late? Sinatra wanted Lucille Ball to play the role. In any case, President Kennedy called Arthur Krim, and that was that. All of that incestuous deal-making and back-scratching is also part of The Devil May Dance, which is why, to me, it was so serendipitous that the timeline worked out. So I have scenes set around the filming of key moments from The Manchurian Candidate. The opening, in which the role of Korea is played by Los Angeles's Franklin Canyon. The Senate press conference. The violent climax during the political party convention in Madison Square Garden. And boy wonder director John Frankenheimer, he turned 32 while filming The Manchurian Candidate, he's a character in my book. Bursting with creativity and ambition, the former TV director had only one previous feature that had been released by that time, The Young Savages, which was 
less than a runaway box office success. O'Brien notes that Frankenheimer thought Manchurian was, quote, his first truly personal project, feeling that the story made an all-too-valid point regarding the political manipulation and conditioning of American society. So for Frankenheimer, a lot was on the line. All right, it's Polish, Gavin. <laughs> now, Sinatra had already been given the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1954 for his role in From Here to Eternity. But in other ways, Sinatra had more on the line as he was approaching 50 and settling into middle age and trying to figure out his role in that era of his life. I've been having this nightmare. Is it about a... Russian general and some Chinese and me and the men who are on the patrol. How did you know that? How do you know? Reviews were decidedly mixed for the film. The New York Times loved the style of the direction, but found the plot too fantastic. Quote, most reviewers agreed that it was quite novel. Whether that was a good thing or not was open to debate, wrote Matthew Fry Jacobson and Gaspar Gonzalez in their collection of academic essays about the film what have they built you to do, the Manchurian Candidate and Cold War America? Quote, one might be tempted to group the Manchurian Candidate with any number of films that were initially dismissed only to be later embraced as cinematic classics, but to do so would be to ignore the fact that from the time Sinatra went to John F. Kennedy to secure his blessings, the project seemed tied to the larger world, to its cultural and socio-political moment in quite exceptional ways. The Manchurian Candidate was, of course, famously released the same week that the Cuban Missile Crisis hit its most intense period and a year and change before an all too real political assassination that would change the United States forever. Sinatra himself was praised quite a bit, even if the film, for understandable reasons, soon became too uncomfortable for many audiences in the early 60s to watch. Sinatra biographer James Kaplan calls his performance in the film, quote, his greatest movie role. The scenes with Janet Lee, both profoundly moving and deliciously surrealistic. Now, whether the chemistry with Janet Lee, whose husband Tony Curtis had just left her for his much younger co-star, whether that chemistry was only on screen, that's a question to which I do not know the answer. But in real life, Sinatra's chemistry with President Kennedy, well, that was exploding into ash and ether. That's part of the backdrop of The Devil May Dance, which I hope you read. But either way, I hope you enjoy this film ahead of its time in ways both tragic and sinister. Please enjoy The Manchurian Candidate.